stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored and the church of Christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel shall not faint by his blood and in his name in his freedom I am free for the love of Jesus Christ who has resurrected me oh, oh, oh. praise the Father praise the Son praise the Spirit three in one God of glory majesty praise forever to the King of kings praise forever to the King of kings so God thank you so much for this time Lord, we just pray protection. We ask for your grace. We ask for your mercy during this time, Lord. But most of all, we thank you that you have risen from the grave, that you are king, that you are Lord today. Lord, all this to your glory. Lord, I just pray for protection over families this morning. Pray that this would be a season of blessing of those who have been impacted financially by this crisis lord pray that your hand is all over the people here lord and also may we continue to be the church to those around us it's in your precious name that we pray amen amen god bless you guys happy easter take care A happy Easter, everyone. Name is Brandon Ziski, the lead pastor. Now, I want you to participate with me wherever you are at, uh, checking in, tuning in. He is risen, and I'm taking it by faith that you just said he is risen indeed. Hey, I want to welcome you this morning, uh, Easter morning. I love Easter, favorite time of the year. And I know this is a completely unprecedented time. We've never, ever had our facilities shut down from celebrating Easter. And I know that some of you right now, let's just be honest, you're watching this in your pajamas and you're kind of excited that you get to like participate Easter service in your pajamas, in the luxury and comfort of your own home. Some of you are like the overachievers, and, it, and I love that it, maybe some of you did this. You put on your Easter best, and you're just like recreating the whole situation at home. Love it. But wherever you're at, I am so humbled and so thankful that you are checking in this morning. This is an unprecedented time. Even though it feels like and it seems like the coronavirus has just shut down the whole world and, and everything seems to be on pause, listen, the church will never be on pause. The church will never shut down. Jesus said that the church will prevail. Like not even death itself can shut the church down. Nothing, 
Death tried to stop Easter from happening some 2,000 years ago, but it didn't happen. Just because our buildings are shut down, it doesn't mean church is shut down. And so this morning, this is an awesome thing to remind ourselves. The church is not about brick and mortar. It's about people. So wherever God's people are gathered, wherever the gospel is proclaimed, we are able to celebrate Easter this morning. And it's an important time for us, if we were to be honest. Right? There is so much uncertainty. There is so much fear. There is so much anxiety. There is so much hurt, isolation, loneliness. It, it, it really does beg the question, what is God doing? And as I was praying and thinking about this message, oddly enough, as I was trying to connect what God is doing today in our time and in our lives um, and trying to think through how to communicate Easter to everybody, um, oddly enough, Bob Ross came to mind. Now, some of you know who Bob Ross is and some of you don't know who Bob Ross is. Bob Ross is a phenomenal artist. He's a painter. And I remember as a kid, like channel surfing back in the day, and I remember coming across this guy with his crazy afro. He just had this soothing smile, and he would draw me in just by the way he talked, and he would invite us to explore his art and even try to do it on our, on our own, all this kind of stuff. And now you got to understand, I'm not an artist. I, I can't paint anything to save my life. I'm a color by number, paint by number kind of guy, right? So I was intrigued. And as I was watching this episode, he would start to paint, and he had this image in his mind that he wanted to create this beautiful landscape, some kind of nature scene. And as I was watching the process of what he was doing, I wasn't able to make the connections that this little blotch of color here in this corner and this little squiggly line that he would call a happy cloud is actually going to be a cloud. Like, I couldn't piece it together. But Bob, he knew the finished product. He knew what he was creating. But for me, I had no clue. I'm not a, tr I don't, I don't have a trained eye in art. I don't know the process. It just seemed to be mind boggling to me that all these random things that he was doing would fit together to create a beautiful picture. Now, what if I were to tell you that trying to understand what God is doing today is sort of like watching Bob Ross work on a painting? Now, I'm not saying that Bob Ross is God. Now, don't hear that. But the process of understanding of how Bob Ross gets to the finished product can be very similar to trying to watch and discern the process how God is unfolding his story. We might even see some of the things that God is doing and just go, this seems pointless, right? Just like a squiggly line on the canvas that he would call a happy cloud. To me, it's just a pointless line. Like it makes no sense. But Bob Ross never fails to create something beautiful. How much more with God? When we look at God and we start to try to discern and understand what he's doing, especially in the world, but let's, let's just be honest, sometimes that is just so large but when we try to understand what God is doing in our own lives, it's difficult. It can feel confusing. It can feel meaningless. Like we can start to kind of even like create our own summary statements in our minds. Like if we're experiencing pain and suffering and isolation and loneliness and even death, God, how is this part of something greater? What are you doing? Where are you? And we're faced with these questions and we might even to be like experiencing disappointment or anger confusion with God. But listen, God is sovereign and God is good. And God is one who is full of love and does nothing but loving things. God can only do good and God is in control and he's more powerful than anything else in this world. He is writing a story. His story that he's writing is absolutely so beautiful. It's so sweeping. It's so compelling, but only he knows what the end looks like, and that's where we struggle. We're caught up in the middle of the story. We experience pain and suffering and confusion in the middle of this story. Now, if, if I were to be honest with you, when I experience pain and when I experience suffering, when I experience things that create anxiousness inside of me, when I have experienced death, or the threat of death, there are moments when I begin to question God. God, are you really good? God, are you really there? God, are you really loving? God, are you really in control? And, and um, dare I even say, there's moments where a thought will come in my mind, is there even a God? 
this Easter, I want to remind us that God is in control, that God is loving, He is good, and He is ever present, and He's doing something far greater than you can ever imagine. This Easter, I want to share with you a story out of the scriptures that show us a, a, a snapshot of what God is doing. I want to share with you a story that not only gives us insight into the story that God has created, I want to share with you a story of how God enters into our pain, how God sympathizes with our, our weaknesses and our frustrations, our sufferings, our confusions, and yes, even our disappointments. Because it's important for us to remember this, that God isn't indifferent to the suffering. He's not indifferent to the confusion. He's not indifferent to our disappointments. Right now, as we're dealing with this coronavirus and the economy and our jobs and not even being able to, some of us, this is a real deal, some of us are not even able to be with our loved ones as they're in the hospital, struggling and suffering. Like, he's not indifferent to these things. So this morning, I want to share with you a story of two sisters who are experiencing or who have experienced a crisis, a crisis that is far beyond them. A crisis that only God can fix, okay? It's a story that um, they can't make sense of Jesus. They cry out to Jesus and they can't piece it together as to what he's doing. They experienced hurt in this story. They experienced pain in the story and, um, and, and even disappointment with God. So if you have a Bible, I encourage you, turn with me to John chapter 11. This is where we're going to find our story this morning. John chapter 11. And I'm going to read for us the first four verses. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, from the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed her Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard this, he said, the illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, if you're not familiar with who Mary and Martha and Lazarus are, um, they're really close friends to Jesus. They're dear friends to Jesus. He would use their home in Bethany as base camp when he was doing ministry in the Judean area around Jerusalem. And so they would, you know, um, put a roof over his head. They would feed him. They would give him a companionship and a relationship. So they were very, very dear. So in this season, somewhere between December and April, okay, not too unlike our time, our situation now, somewhere between December and April, Lazarus gets this illness. And what probably just started out with a cough or a sniffling, it may be like a slight little fever or body ache, just seemed to have escalated. And Mary and Martha probably did all that they could to help him, to make him comfortable. You know, maybe even made him chicken noodle soup. I don't know. But maybe they even called the doctors and tried all the local remedies to deal it. But what they experienced was this illness that Lazarus had was unrelenting and only seemed to have gotten worse. Mary and Martha knew that Jesus was within the area of Bethany. He was roughly 15 miles away, so they sent word by a messenger to go get Jesus. And this message was, Jesus, the one whom you love, Lazarus, your friend, he's sick. Now, Jesus obviously knew that Mary and Martha wouldn't have disturbed him unless it was a dire situation. He gets this word, he hears it, and he just simply said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God. Now, before I continue in the story, I want you to make this connection because some people wrestle with this thought. God, if I love you, and God, if you love me, why am I suffering? Or why am I experiencing suffering? Or what, why is my loved one experiencing suffering? Why is there pain? Why am I feeling this disappointment and frustration and confusion? I want you to know something right now. Pain, suffering, sickness, death, it doesn't discriminate. If you love God, it doesn't discriminate. Even if God loves you, it doesn't discriminate. And listen, God loves all of you. You are one whom he loves. We just live in a broken and fallen world where sin has ravaged God's good creation. In fact, that's why he came. In fact, that's why we are here talking about Easter. He came into this world to deal with the sickness, to deal with the pain, to deal with the suffering. And not only that, he too experienced the suffering and pain and the discouragement far more 
than you and I. Okay? So Jesus hears that the one whom he loves has gotten sick. Now, when I have a crisis, and I'm sure you're in the same boat, when I have a crisis, when I cry out to God, when I ask God, when I need Jesus, listen, I need him now. I need him to move now, like to act now, not later, not in a few moments, like right now. Like it's almost like, like Jesus, if you don't show up, things aren't going to get worse. Jesus, if you don't act now, it's going to be too late. Jesus, if you don't respond, I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my wealth. I'm, I might even get sicker. Lord, if you don't do something about this, I might lose my loved ones. God, if you don't show up now, things are going to get bad. I'm reaching out to you, Jesus. I'm finally praying to you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. I'm trying here, Jesus. Would you Throw me a bone and do something, Jesus. And it, we see this glimpse. Jesus is like, listen, this illness doesn't lead to death. It's for the glory of God. In other words, it's to reveal more of who I am. Let's look at verse 5. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister Le in, in, in Lazarus. He loved Martha and her sister in Lazarus. Now, the reason why I want to stop here is because this word love that is used to describe how Jesus feels towards Mary, Martha, and Lazarus is so important. It's the word agape. He loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus with agape love, unconditional love, unrelenting love, never changing love, the never ending love, the ongoing and constant love. Start to piece this together. Okay, I need you to hear this and to understand this truth. God loves all with this, with this agape love, this never-ending love, this unceasing, ongoing, never-changing love. Remember that because this next verse is going to create a tension. So, verse 6, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And I read that, and if I don't understand what God is doing, I'm just going to be honest with you, that frustrates me. That discourages me from crying out to God. It's not what you expect. If you hear that God loves us with this unconditional love, this unrelenting love, this unchanging love, if God were to hear that I need him, that I am ill, God, come to my rescue, we would expect and rightly assume that he would come immediately. But that's not what the text tells us. It tells us that he stayed two days longer. He loved them with agape love, so he stayed two days longer. That brings up so many questions. What are you doing, Jesus? Why would you do this? This makes no sense. I don't understand how you're working here. If you love me, wouldn't you respond right away? But don't forget this. Just like Bob Ross, the process is confusing, but the finished product is beautiful. Same with God. Now, let's imagine our imaginations going back to Bethany. Imagine for a moment the sisters feeling anxious and eager, waiting for Jesus to come. They just sent the messenger. They knew it's going to take roughly a day and a half to two days to get to Jesus. Like they knew that, where he would be. And they would rightly assume that when Jesus got the message that he would immediately come, that he would immediately get there. Why wouldn't he? Every passing hour, you can imagine that they're watching Lazarus, their brother, struggle for life. Hang on, Lazarus. He's coming. We sent for him, okay? And when he gets here, just like we know, we believe this, he will make everything right. He will heal you. Just hang on, Lazarus. It's going to be okay, Lazarus. Take another drink, Lazarus. Are you okay? Can I do anything for you, Lazarus? And you can just imagine, okay, like Mary and Martha getting up every, like, probably 10, 30 minutes, looking out the door, looking over the hill to see if Jesus is coming, but they're not seeing anything. Thing. And hours pass into, like, like minutes turn into hours, and hours just keep slipping by. And then the next thing you know, you can just see the sisters looking at Lazarus. Lazarus, hang on. No, no, no. Lazarus, keep, Lazarus, stay with us. Lazarus, keep your eyes open, Lazarus. No. And he dies. Can you imagine the emotion in that moment? Like, what would you be feeling if you were marrying Martha? What, what would you be feeling? Where, where was he? 
We sent for him. Did he like give up on us? Was something else more important than our issue? Like just imagine all of the circumstances you're in right now. Crying out for God, where are you? Why didn't you fix it? What are you doing? Do you even care? These three, very clear, Jesus loved them with unconditional love. And yet they weren't exempt from experiencing pain, sorrow, death. They weren't exempt from facing confusion, hurt, disappointment, and probably even anger. I mean, he could have, Jesus could have just thought it. He could have just went, yep, okay, he's ill. Um, God, heal Lazarus now. Like he could have just did it there, but nothing. Why was heaven sh like shut, as it were, in this moment? And how is Jesus' apparent delay, love, like, like, I don't know about you, but when I feel like God isn't responding when I pray, it doesn't feel like he's loving me. It feels like he's denying me or rejecting me or not hearing me. God, are you too busy? Did I do something wrong? Is there something wrong with me? Did I do something? Like, like, is it because of my faith? Like, what? God, what are you doing? But God loves it's just that we have a hard time understanding the story, the process of what God is doing. But we have to be patient. We have to trust him and know that he is working all things out for good because God wastes nothing. There are zero, listen, listen, listen. There are zero delays with God. God is never delayed. God is never delayed. God is never slow in accordance to his promises. He always comes on time. His timing is always perfect. It's us. We don't feel like it's on time, but he's never late. Now, look at this. So Jesus, you know, he said to him, okay, it's been two days. He got the news, Lazarus ill. It's been two days. And he's like, okay, let's finally go. And the disciples are like, uh, are you sure you want to go there? Like, didn't they want to try to kill you? And Jesus goes, listen, you know, let's just do what we need to do. There's 12 hours in a day. We're not going to stumble. We got work to do while it's still day. And then after a while, he said to him, he's like, listen, our friend Lazarus is asleep. And all of a sudden the disciples are super confused. They're like, well, Jesus, like, if he's sleeping, <laughs> Um, he'll wake up. And you just read this, you're like, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Guys, would Mary and Martha really send a messenger to tell Jesus that Lazarus was taking a nap? <laughs> like, really? I mean, they knew the word sleep. And even in this time, sleep was used as a, a, a metaphor for death. And so Jesus had to like say it to them plainly. Like he goes, then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus died. Look at this in verse 14. Lazarus has died. And for your sake, this is going to be confusing. And for your sake, I am glad that I wasn't there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Every time I read that, every time I read that, I go, wait, Jesus, so you're glad that you didn't go and you're glad that he died and, 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 like, and you're okay that Mary and Martha are struggling and hurt and confused and disappointed. You're okay? Remember, He's doing something far greater. And we get a glimpse right here, so that you may believe. So let's just, let, let's just take a moment and collect our thoughts. Where is Lazarus right now? Lazarus is in heaven with the Father. Not a bad place to be. The best place to be. Jesus isn't sad over that. He knows, like, Lazarus is in a great, great place. The best place to be. So, what, what is going on? Like, so like he, he loved them all. So why was, is he waiting? Like, so he didn't just like love Mary, Martha and Lazarus, right? He loved them, but he also loves his disciples and he loves the crowd that's going to be there in mourning. In fact, he even loves you and I. So is there a greater thing that he's trying to get us at? Like, what is the greatest issue, the greatest virus, the greatest illness in this world that Jesus can conquer? Is it the coronavirus? Is it the economy not downplaying that? Or is it sin and death? And the only way for us to be conquerors with Jesus, to move from death to life, it's through faith. And sometimes we need to see who he is in order to confess that he is the son of God, that he is greater than death, and that with him there's always hope. And so in this moment, he's like, listen, 
Lazarus is dead, but there's something far greater that's going on. He's given us a glimpse into the backdrop of this story. Verse 17. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. Okay? Wherever you're at, say it with me. Okay? Come on. On the count of three, I want you to say four days. One, two, three. Four days. He's been dead for four days. That is significant. You see, in Jewish thought, in one of the teachings in the Talmud, they had this thought. It's not scriptural, but it was just a running thought that the first three days after someone dies, the spirit hovers over the body. But on the fourth day, that spirit goes away to never return. And we know medically that the fourth day, we're like the body starts to decompose. So this fourth day is speaking of an ir irreversible event. Death has won. There's nothing that can be done. Not even Jesus. Like this is the thought. The fourth day is beyond hope. It's beyond change. It's irreversible, right? They, in, in the fourth day, Lazarus is dead, like completely dead, not like partly dead, a little pinch, Princess Bride plug there. Like he, he's, he's not mostly dead, he's dead dead. Nothing that can be done. And everybody knew that. He's done, dead. They had the funeral, they wrapped him, the stone's been placed in front of the tomb. Death has won, Jesus can't even do anything. Death is more powerful, death has more influence, and that's the importance of the fourth day. Don't miss that. Think about things in your life right now. Look at the world. Look at the economy. Are there things that feel irreversible, hopeless, outside of God's control, like that God can't do anything about it now? Maybe you prayed about it and he didn't respond and you just given up hope. This is just the way it's going to be. Listen, this story's for you. Now look at this. Verse 20. Martha heard that Jesus was coming, and so she went and met him. She just got up out of the house, here he comes, and she goes. And if you were to look at the tone and the tense of the, of the language here in this verse, you're going to discover that Mary's upset. You're going to discover that Mary's very, or Martha is very upset, very emotional, and she's just letting Jesus know what she thinks. Verse 21, Lord, if you had been here, you can, you can feel this emotion, can't you? Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you would have showed up when we called, if you would have come right away, if you would have stopped doing whatever you thought was so important, none of this would have happened. She's kind of like blaming him. If only you would have been here, Jesus. If you would have come when I've asked. If you would have allowed me to keep my job. If you would have allowed me to stay healthy. If only, Jesus, you would have answered my prayer and kept him or her healthy. Jesus, if only you would have done what we asked, this wouldn't have happened. Folks, listen. There is anger here. There's confusion here. And there's disappointment here. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. It's almost as if she doesn't know what else to say. It's almost like this is a flicker of hope. She's trying. She knows that she can't really be angry with Jesus here. You know, she's like, oh, but I know even now you could do something. Listen, in this admission, she's, she's actually showing us a little glimmer of faith. She had faith, but it's limited faith. She, she, she goes... Jesus, if you would have been here when there was an opportunity, when the window of opportunity of change was there, you could have done something there, but now it's the fourth day. Not even you. You can't do anything. It's irreversible. She believed, but she, like, she needs to understand more of who Jesus is. But even now, even now, you could do something. And Jesus goes, your brother will rise again. And I love how Martha responds. Well, I know that he will in the last day. I know that he will rise in the res resurrection in the last day. When that event happens later, I know I will see him again in heaven. Yes, I believe that. She just gave the Sunday school answer. But really, this is a thread of hope. And she didn't believe that Jesus was talking about right now because it's the fourth day and it's impossible. She's not thinking of it now. She's thinking about later. Yes, you'll make it all right later. But right now, 
it is what it is. She had no idea that those two words, even now, is, has become the anthem of Easter. Even now, he can do it. Even now, in your doubts, in your hurt, in your disappointment, he can resurrect it. Even now, in your family, he can renew it. Even now, in your marriage, he can heal it and fix it. Even now, God can forgive you. Even now, he can snap the chains of addiction. Even now, he can set you free from sin. He can set you free from death. Even now, he can give you freedom from all that causes anxiety and anxiousness in your life. It may seem too late to us, but with Jesus, it's never too late. He's able. If you would have been here, Jesus, none of this would have happened. But even now, I believe you can. He will rise again. Yes, I know he will do it later. Now look how Jesus confronts that. He goes, Martha... I am the resurrection, and I am the life. And whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, Martha? To which Martha says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who's coming into the world. She didn't say, yes, I believe you are the resurrection. She just said, yes, I believe you are the Christ. But Jesus is making it crystal clear that resurrection is not an event. The resurrection is a person. I am the person. And wherever I am, I bring life. I turn dead things into life. I turn things that are bleak and broken, and I bring healing and restoration. I am the resurrection and the life. Even though in this life, in this body, you're going to face suffering, pain, and disappointment, all these things, and even though in this life you're going to die, for the believer... Death is a transition marker, and that's it, because there is no grave for the believer. Death has no power, because I'm the resurrection. I'm the one who conquers death. Do you believe this? Folks, can I tell you something? When you are confronted with death, or the threat of death, or the fear of death, it becomes a litmus test for our belief, doesn't it? What do we really believe about Jesus? What do we really believe about this life? Do we really believe that life in heaven is better than life here on this earth? Do you believe this? Now Mary comes. Mary comes and she falls at the feet of Jesus. And this is a posture of worship. Even though she's going to say the same thing that Martha said, Jesus, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died she too is experiencing the pain, the frustration, the hurt, and the disappointment. She's feeling it too, but she's in a posture of worship. That hasn't changed. Jesus, if you would have done something. Now here's where I want you to understand and see how Jesus sympathizes with us. Even when we bring our hurts, even when we bring our frustrations and our disappointments, he doesn't rebuke us for it. He could have. He understands that we don't understand the picture. He understands that we don't know exactly all that he's doing. He knows that we're experiencing hurt and confusion and that we're in the midst of pain. He knows that. He doesn't rebuke them. He speaks gently, softly. He sympathizes with them. He weeps with them. He hurts with them. He could have said, well, now that you have this attitude with me, well, I was going to raise him from the dead, but now I think I'm just going to go back to Jerusalem. He doesn't do that. And praise God, he doesn't do that. God is big enough to handle our disappointments. He invites them in because he wants us to see who he is. Look at this. He goes with Mary, and he sees all of these people who are weeping. And the text tells us that he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. In other words, like the, the Greek here, the word here tells us that he, he was snorted. It's like this deep gut angry response. He's looking at all these people who are weeping and hurting and, and feeling confused and not understanding the situation. And Jesus is, he's greatly troubled. He's angry at death. He's angry at the suffering. He's angry at the pain. But why doesn't Jesus just fix it? He is. He's doing it something far better, far greater than we can even ask or imagine. Where death makes us angry, death makes us scared, it does it to Jesus. He's not scared, but it makes him angry. And he comes, he's like, Ugh. And in that moment, he goes, where have you laid him? And they take him to the tomb. And in verse 35, we're told that Jesus wept. He weeps. Why? 
Why is he weeping? He's not weeping because Lazarus is dead. He knows where Lazarus is. He's in heaven. He might be weeping because he knows he has to bring Lazarus back from heaven, back to this earth, but that's not it. He's weeping because he sees the pain of Mary, the pain of Martha, the pain of other friends, fellow Jews. He feels it, and he's weeping with them. He knows his world is broken. And folks, listen, that is exactly why he came. That's exactly why he came. He's entered into our pain. He's entered into our suffering. He's entered into our confusion and our hurt. He knows exactly what we feel. You're not alone. He's not indifferent. In fact, this whole week that we just were in reminds us that Jesus faced pain and suffering and confusion at some levels and isolation and rejection far worse than we could ever. In fact, the Bible even calls him a man of sorrows. He took our sin. He went to the cross, nailed on the cross to be publicly humiliated by his own creation, mocking him, hanging there naked, bleeding for hours and hours, suffering. Why? Because he loves us so that he could deal and reverse the curse of sin in this world so that he would die and be buried, and that in three days he could conquer death forever, so that you and I could always have hope. And folks, this is the triumph of Easter, is that there is no grave, nothing that could ever separate us from life. Death is just a transition. Death is a promotion in this life. He knows, and that's why he weeps. He's entered fully into this. Look at verse 37. Could he have not have healed him? Absolutely. But why didn't he? Because he wanted people to see who he is so that we could place our faith in him. He prays out loud in a little bit moment, not for his own sake, but for the sake of everybody else around him so that they would see the glory of God, so that they would see who Jesus is. He wanted to nurture their faith because the greatest virus, the greatest disease, the greatest illness in his life is sin and death. That's what he cares about most. If he, like, listen, listen, listen for a moment. He's going to bring Lazarus back from the dead, but Lazarus is going to die again. We're going to, we can be saved and we're still going to struggle. We're still going to die, but he's fixing the greater issue. The greater issue is sin and death. That's what matters. And now we can face, sin, or we can face suffering and pain and disappointment through faith in Jesus, and we can be rooted in hope knowing that there's no grave that could ever separate us from the love of Christ. He comes to the tomb, ready to open it. And Martha, Martha comes up. He's like, Jesus, no, 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 no. Jesus, he stinks. It's been four days. We already had the funeral. You're a little late to the, par the party. It's over. Done. Jesus. Jesus looks at Martha and goes, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Did, you, did I not tell you? Martha doesn't respond. It's almost as if Jesus is saying, Martha, will you believe me enough to let me do what I do best? Will you let me be who I am in this moment? And she just steps back. And he cries out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And, and imagine this moment, like also you just hear this thud. Like he's wrapped up. So like, how is he walking out? He has to obviously be like, shh, 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 or hopping, right? I, like I can't help that you forgive me for this. I, I can't help but think of the movie Thriller in this moment. Like, and he comes out of the tomb. You can just imagine the awe and the shock of this whole moment. Like people just staring because this is the fourth day, friends. This should not happen. And here he is walking out, wrapped up like a mummy. And it's like, they're just frozen. And Jesus even has to say, it's like, hey, unbind him. Let him go. Take the grave clothes off of him. Folks, right here, what happened with Lazarus is the movie trailer of the gospel. This is the preview of why Jesus died on the cross on Friday and why he rose again on Sunday so that he can call your name. Because listen, the Bible tells us 
You're dead in sin. You're in that grave. You're Lazarus, apart from Jesus. You're wrapped up in dead man's clothes. Fourth day, irreversible. You can't do anything about it. Jesus comes to your grave, calls out your name. Right now, wherever you're at, he's calling out your name. Come out. And as you come out, he says, take off the grave clothes. Clothe him with new, new life, new hope. You see, this is the greater story. We, we don't understand everything that's happening. We're never going to understand everything that's happening. But two things Easter reminds us. Jesus conquers death. Jesus is stronger than any irreversible situation facing you. He calls your name, brings you out, gives you new life. There is now no grave that can hold you back. Death is a transition. It's a promotion. But not only that, because I know there's some of us right now who really struggle with God. There's some of you who maybe this is your first time back, listening, trying again. Maybe this is just a little flicker of hope. Maybe God, there is a God. Many of us wonder if God's even good, if he cares, if he's near. He is. Look at how he interacted. He didn't rebuke them in their disappointment. He loved them unconditionally. He knew exactly what he was doing and he did the very best thing that he could have done for them, for Lazarus, for us. He weeps with us. He mourns with us. He suffers with us. And he's conquered for us. And if you were to read on the story, you see this bizarre thing where it says many believed, but yet there were some who didn't. And that's the unfortunate part of Easter is that even though we have proof all over the place that Jesus conquered death in a grave, we see it in the countless numbers of changed lives through Jesus, of people who move from death to life, there's still people who won't receive him, who won't believe him. But listen, as it says in John 5, 25, now is the time when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. Do you hear his voice this morning? Do you hear him calling you out of that grave? If you hear his voice, respond. Nothing is fatal. Nothing is final with him. And the question I want to ask all of you is the same question that Jesus asked Martha. I am the resurrection, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? And maybe this morning, all you have is just a flicker, a slightly burning wick. There's a story in the Bible where someone said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe that you are the resurrection, but listen, I still wrestle with pain. I still wrestle with um, um, emotional questions, physical questions. I don't understand everything about you, but I believe enough. Would you help me in my unbelief? Listen, he'll meet you right there. He'll meet you right there. There's more to the story. Can I encourage you to wait for Jesus to do what he does best? And that is to bring life to dead things. He is the resurrection. With him, there is no fear in life. With him, there is no fear in death. With him, there is simply no grave. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray for my friends, whoever they are at this morning. Lord, I ask that you would meet them right where they're at. That whatever questions or disappointments or frustrations they have, Lord, that they would bring them to you and that they would hear your voice and trust you in the process. Trust that you, are know, you know what you are doing, that you are making beautiful things out of us, that you are turning broken things into things that are renewed and whole. Lord, I pray for those individuals who maybe have never given their life to you, have never confessed that you are the Son of God, that you are the one who died for the sins of the world, for my sins, that you, you conquered death for me, and that you're offering life. Lord, I pray for them that maybe they would say yes 
and receive this gift of salvation that you extended by grace and mercy, and they would receive it by faith and faith alone, not by any merits, any effort, any goodness, any amount of anything on their end, but always and purely by what you've done. And Lord, I pray for the rest of us that we would never, ever forget that with Jesus, because he is the resurrection life, there is no fear in this life, there is no fear in death, and that there is absolutely no grave that could ever hold us back. So Jesus, we praise you, we give you glory, thank you for this living hope, and thank you for being God and sovereign in this time, and in this nation, and in this world. Lord, would you be near the brokenhearted this morning? Would you let these folks know that you are mourning with them, for those who are mourning? For those who are rejoicing, let them know that you are rejoicing with them. We thank you for everything you've done. We thank you for conquering death. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed. Have a great Easter, and we would love the journey with you. We are a church that strives to be simply about Jesus as we meet, know, and follow him. So we want to invite you in. No matter where you're at in this season, we have something for you. Engage with us. Contact us. We would love to walk alongside of you. Blessings, everyone, and have a great Easter.